We all like to think that Spycraft is a lot sexier than it actually is, thanks to the exploits, fictional or otherwise, of James Bond, Sterling Archer, Rod Dahl and Sir Christopher Lee, intelligence work often looks like a glorious romp involving driving fast cars, shooting guns, banging hot aristocrats, wearing turtlenecks and hunting Nazis. However, this isn't exactly true. In the vast majority of cases, Spycraft is really just a bunch of nerds sitting in dark rooms, cracking codes, conducting psyops and spreading misinformation. Basically, just proto-internet trolling. After all, a larger-than-life chad like James Bond doesn't exactly make for a good spy, especially when heads turn and loins quiver everywhere he goes. The best spies are stuffy, middle-aged bureaucrats in plain grey suits that hide in plain sight, because no one cares enough to actually notice them. Today's mad lad is one of the greatest secret agents of all time, and you probably haven't even heard of him because he actually did his job properly. A mastermind at the very top of an elite spy network that was under such deep cover that it might as well not exist because it didn't. Juan Pucol Garcia, codename Spymaster Garbo. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Get the greatest VPN deal in the market and enjoy the most affordable online protection for just $1.49 per month plus 12 months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Enjoy blazing fast speeds and stream your favourite shows in high quality or play your favourite games at lightning fast speed, all while protecting all of your devices including your Android or Apple phones with just a single subscription. I enjoy using Atlas VPN because it is seamless, fast and easy to use. No one should have to deal with corporations, governments or hackers spying and stealing their data. Atlas VPN gives you a way to avoid all of that. I use it to watch shows on the American Netflix and Adult Swim because annoyingly they have much better content. You will also be safer from malware and stop annoying ads since the VPN immediately blocks all connections to malicious links, ads and trackers and notifies you if someone ever tries to steal your data. Save money while shopping online and get the best deals while getting the most out of your online subscriptions such as Netflix, Spotify, airlines, hotels and even more. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a massive Black Friday discount. Get a 3 year subscription at only $1.49 a month plus 12 months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Time is running out so get your deal by clicking the link in the description down below while also helping the channel. Juan Pucol Garcia was born into a liberal family in Barcelona on the 14th of February 1912, and much of his early life is just as boring as it sounds. As he grew up, he proved to be quite a disappointment to his parents. He dropped out of school after taking a particular disliking to the headmaster, he couldn't handle the dreariness of his first job at a hardware store so he quit to pursue an arts degree, and that didn't pan out either because Pukul's appendix burst before he could even start. But as he recovered, Pukul changed his mind about studying the arts and went to the Royal Poultry School at Arenas de Mar to learn how to be a chicken farmer. Pukul just couldn't find his place anywhere in the world and he seemed to have no particular talent for anything. But what he did have was a very active imagination. As described by his biographer, Stefan Talte, he'd been a dreamer since childhood, which he spent covered in bandages. Because Pukul was also a bit of a klutz. In 1931, Pukul was called up to serve his compulsory national service with a cavalry unit. And he had an awful time. 
he made for an absolutely terrible soldier. He hated his comrades, he hated his commander, he hated his horse, and the only good thing about his service was the fact that he somehow managed to pass the six months without being sent out to actually do anything, because things wouldn't kick off in Spain for another few years. But when shit hit the fan in 1936, Puko was busy managing a chicken farm. Now, I'm not going to try and explain the intricacies of the Spanish Civil War in any real depth, because the factions in that shit show splintered off in such complex ways that we would be here all day if I was trying to untangle that mess. To put it very briefly, a nationalist insurgency led by Francisco Franco and supported by Italy and Germany clashed very, very violently with the incumbent Republicans and the Popular Front, which was made up of sub-factions of anarchists, republicans and communists. And there was also a monarch in exile in the mix as well. And once the Soviets threw in their support, exactly what you would expect happened. There was... A lot of infighting. Like, like, a lot of infighting. Pukul was drafted onto the Republican side of the war, and being pretty left-leaning, you would think that he would rather be with them than the Nationalists. But he really saw both sides as being equally awful. His opinion of the Republicans was further soured because he was in Catalonia, where the Popular Front's infighting was at its most savage. So, Puko just decided to not show up and fight for them because he wanted no part in the killing on either side. So, it wasn't long before Puko was arrested for going AWOL. After spending a week in prison, Pukol was actually busted out by a member of a secret organisation called the Socorro Blanco, who helped out those who were persecuted for essentially being conscientious objectors. He then spent a year hiding almost completely alone in a taxi driver's flat. After the driver and his family left, the only person that Pukol saw was the girl that brought him food three times a week. Eventually, she brought him fake papers provided by the Socorro Blanco that certified him as being too old for the army. But, despite being only 25 years old at the time, it was an easy lie to sell, because the loss of 20 kilograms and his fear of being caught had stressed him out so much that he had actually aged. Those of you who have seen Come and See will understand what I'm talking about. Pucho then got himself a gig managing a poultry farm near the French border, and he actually considered crossing over to escape the war entirely until he heard that a group had already tried to do that and had just been caught by the guards, which resulted in a number of injuries and even deaths. The border guard had also been strengthened afterwards, so Pucho found himself too much of a chicken to leave the chicken farm and try his luck. But eventually the farm started to fail and his relationship with his bosses got so bad that he just quit. The Republicans had treated Pukul so badly that he decided that the only way he would be left alone was to join the Nationalists. Can relate. Obviously he was the furthest thing from a Francoist, but enemy of my enemy and all that. But it wasn't just himself that he was worried about. After all, clamping down a bit too hard on draft dodgers is one thing, but the Republicans had also gone after Pukul's family, arresting and charging a number of them as counter-revolutionaries. Fortunately, they were well-connected enough to be released, but they very narrowly avoided execution. Because communists... Pukul decided that the only way he could actually reach the Nationalists was to enlist as a Republican soldier, get sent to the front lines, and then desert. Which, after a very miserable time in the army, he actually did. His flight to the Nationalist front lines was very, very dangerous, but he made it by the skin of his teeth, and he was immediately interrogated and imprisoned. Fortunately, he was able to write to his family and an old friend of his father was able to vouch for him as an honest, apolitical Christian and get him released. But despite his best hopes, the Nationalists didn't leave Pukul alone. While he wasn't fighting any longer, they put him to good use as a signals unit officer, which, like most things, he wasn't very good at. 
And he wasn't even particularly well treated either because Puko got into some pretty serious trouble that landed him in jail, which was expressing sympathy for the monarchy. Little bit based. After being completely unable to catch a break, the Spanish Civil War eventually ended with a nationalist victory and Pukol becoming staunchly anti-communist and anti-fascist, which manifested as a bitter hatred of both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Elevated to this level of enlightened centrism, Pukol returned to civilian life and owned a cinema for a spell. Though, he, like many other things, didn't have much luck with that business. As Pukul's biographer Talti put it, that imagination cursed him throughout his early life. Pukul was so convinced that he had a great part to play in world affairs that he was a disaster at everyday life. However, while his career aspirations were practically non-existent, Pukol was lucky in love as he married a banker's secretary named Araceli Gonzalez Carballo, who was very well known for being quite the knockout, even by Mediterranean standards. By 1939, the cinema venture had failed, and Pukol was working as a hotel manager when an unexpected guest finally provided him with the first glimpse of his true potential. Don Enrique, Duke of Latour, had come to Pujol with a problem. His two elderly companions, who he called his aunts, hadn't been able to get any scotch whisky since the Civil War broke out. However, they were in luck because Pujol knew that it was very easy to get a hold of in Portugal. So, he managed to make a deal with the Duke. He would go and get the booze, and all he needed in return was the paperwork required to do so. And obviously, a wee taught for himself. Now, in this case, a passport might sound like more of a business expense than an actual reward. But the thing was, during this time, passports were very, very, very hard to come by. Because fascist regimes tend to not be very enthusiastic about people leaving. But if anyone can get their hands on one, a pair of thirsty Francoist princesses absolutely could. And if managing to pull the hottest girl in Spain with that hairline wasn't confirmation enough, this little adventure proved that Puko had maxed out his charisma stat because he had just managed to simply talk his way into possession of this most prized document that most people would have killed and died for. So, passport in hand, Puko hopped over the Spanish-Portuguese border and got the Duke and his aunts six bottles of black market whiskey. A few weeks after this little adventure, World War II broke out, and despite Pukul's hatred of war and fighting, he couldn't just stand by and watch despite being safe and out of the way in a neutral country. As he put it himself, my humanist convictions would not allow me to turn a blind eye to the enormous suffering that was being unleashed by this psychopath. Yeah, Pukul wasn't a particular fan of fascism and he wanted to do what he could to fight against it for, and I quote, the good of humanity. However, Pukul was never a particularly useful soldier. And even then, his fighting days were long over. So, in early 1941, Pukul went to the British Embassy in Madrid and offered his services as a spy to MI6. He was spurred on by his admiration of Britain standing alone against the Axis at the start of the war, and he certainly wasn't going to work for fucking Stalin. Pukul had no meaningful qualifications, experience, or connections for spycraft. So, at first, it didn't seem like he had much to offer. But even then, it's not as if MI6 could have done any worse by taking him on, because around about this time, MI6 were planning stupid hijinks like trying to convince the Germans that they had dumped 200 man-eating sharks into the English Channel, and faking the second coming of Christ in the German countryside by getting some guy to dress like a hippie, prattle on about peace, and then stage some miracles. But Pukul wasn't what the British were looking for, so they rejected him three times. However, Pukul didn't let this deter him, and he decided that he would be more useful to the British if he were already on Germany's payroll and had their trust, so that he could sell himself to the British as a double agent instead of simply being the little Spaniard that could. 
So, Puchol got to work reading up on fascist doctrine and taking on the persona of a Nazi fanatic. He pretended to be a Spanish official who made regular business trips to London where he could exploit the connection such a position provided to do his fascist duty. Then Puchol got his wife to act as the middleman between himself and the Nazis in Madrid on behalf of her Francoist veteran husband, which was made believable by the fact that that was technically true. The Germans accepted Puchol's offer to spy for them and got him into contact with a man by the codename of Federico, who would go on to become Puchol's handler. Puchol's experience as a Signal Corps officer was certainly a helpful point on his CV, but what really made him attractive to the Germans was the fact that he came from a neutral country. So he could easily move to Britain with the right paperwork which he needed to source because his passport was only good for getting him into Portugal. And this would be Federico's first assignment for him. He tried to get one from the embassy in Madrid, putting his imagination to good use by spinning a yarn about his late father having left funds and shares in Britain that he had bestowed upon him, but he had left the paperwork in a safe deposit box in Portugal. But this story was rejected. So instead, Pucco tried his luck in getting a visa from the Spanish consulate and embassy in Portugal, which he figured out would be a lot easier, but the wheels of bureaucracy turned far too slowly and eventually a different avenue presented itself. While in Lisbon, Pucol happened to befriend a gentleman who was in possession of a diplomatic visa, and he was stupid enough to proudly show it off. While out in a casino, Puko feigned illness at the roulette table and retired to their hotel room, where he found and took pictures of this man's documents. With the photos in hand, Puko then talked a printer into forging a visa for him, which he then brought to Federico. Having passed this sort of initiation, Pukol was formally recruited and trained in espionage and secret writing by the Abwehr, who were the Wehrmacht's intelligence service, and he was codenamed Alaric Arabel, the latter being a portmanteau of Arachiri Baya. Baya is tapas for beautiful, by the way. So his codename was beautiful. A bit gay, uh, to be honest, I'm... I'm actually kind of surprised the Germans allowed it. And it wasn't long before it was time for Arabelle's first assignment. He was given £600, which is £42,000 adjusted for printer Gober. He was also given Secret Inc, a Spanish address to send his reports to, and orders to go to Britain and recruit some agents. Arabelle considered going to the British Embassy and showing them all of the cool spy shit that he had that the Germans had given him to prove that he had in fact infiltrated their intelligence service. But there was a risk that the British would just see him as a German spy and instantly arrest him, instead of seeing that he had something to offer. So, instead of going to Britain, Arabelle moved to Lisbon and got to work. And his wife Araceli delivered some of the first messages to help sell the idea that Arabelle was actually in England. But to make the ruse airtight, Arabelle quickly recruited his first agent, an airline pilot who he had befriended and persuaded to regularly take his post to Lisbon, and from there it would be mailed to his handler in Spain, to obviously stop the pesky British Secret Service from reading all of their correspondence. This... Pilot, however, uh, didn't actually exist, it wasn't a real person, but it was the perfect fabrication to explain why, despite having been sent to London, none of Arabelle's correspondence was going through British Post. But what was in this correspondence? Well, nothing true or substantial, because after all, Arabelle wasn't actually in a position where he would even know anything, and even if he did, he wouldn't betray his dream employer, the British. So, Arabelle just made everything up with the pretty funny results because Arabelle didn't actually speak English, had never even been to Britain, and knew basically nothing about Britain. And to the native observer, it kind of showed. A couple of Arabelle's cultural observations of our great nation included that there are in Glasgow men who will do anything for a litre of wine. Which... I already right, kind of true, but also fuck you. Now, you would think that the Germans would have taught Arabelle 
something about the country he was supposed to be infiltrating to help him blend in. And you would think that they would at least know enough about the country that they are currently at war with to notice his mistakes. But the quality of the Abwehr training just, it just wasn't great. Basically, if the warfare fundamental didn't have the word Panzer in it, the Germans just really didn't give a shit. So their agents were pretty prone to culture shock. This is because Hitler actually saw the British as fellow Aryans, and he didn't think that we would stand against him. So, he didn't want to damage relations with us by sending in spies in the 30s. As a result, their intelligence services were severely lacking compared to ours. Also, spycraft requires social skills. And they're German. But this wasn't a problem for Arabel because he wasn't in it to be a good Nazi spy, Quite the opposite, actually. To gather the information that padded out his reports, Arabelle used reference books, magazines, newspapers, encyclopedias, adverts, travel guides, such as the Blue Guide to Great Britain, and a French-English dictionary of military terms as sources. But despite all of his research, Arabelle couldn't make sense of converting between pence, shillings, and pounds, so he did all of his expenses in dollars. But the Germans couldn't see that all of this information came from Arabelle himself. His information was supposed to come from his agents because his mission was to recruit agents. So Arabelle built his own fake spy network. He created 27 fake agents. Seven were recruited by Arabelle himself and the other 20 sub-agents were recruited by those first seven agents none of whom actually existed. And these guys weren't just names on a page. You know that imagination that got Arabelle into so much trouble in his early life? Well, it was now paying dividends hand over fist because Arabelle really, really committed to the bit. Every single agent was a fully fleshed out character with an entire unique life and backstory and they were scattered all across the country and all over the world, as far afield as Ceylon and Canada and occupying positions as high up as the Ministry of Information. Some of these agents included Pedro the Venezuelan, an Indian poet named Rags, a linguist with the War Office who hated communists, a Greek seaman, an alcoholic RAF officer in Glasgow, very original prick, a Gibraltarian waiter, and a group of Welsh nationalists named the Brothers of the Aryan World Order, led by a man named Donny. That last one is my absolute favourite. Oh, we must secure the existence of our rugby in a future for white leaks everywhere, David. <laughs> I'm sorry, like... Nothing is threatening in a Welsh accent. Right, nothing. But the best part of all of this isn't the wacky and colourful characters that Arabelle made up, but the fact that the Germans were actually paying all of their salaries. The Habwehr was paying the salaries of 27 spies that didn't even exist. At one point, Arabelle even asked for a raise to stop his agents from giving up, and they sent him £20,000, which was no small chunk of change back then. And the Germans must have thought that they were getting their money's worth because they were even sending back reports assessing all of the agents' performances. <laughs> agents who didn't exist. And those assessments went quite well because despite all of the reports being absolute bollocks, Arabelle was really good at gaining and maintaining the trust of the Germans. He achieved this by feeding the Germans little bits of what he called chicken feed, which were snippets of true information about troop movements and other such things mixed in with all of the fake shit that he threw in there to throw them off. And in every case, the true information was either so completely inconsequential that you could hardly call it intelligence, or Arabelle deliberately sent it too late for the information to even be of any use. As Arabelle walked away, the Germans started to hang on his every word, to the point where he and his fake spies, who didn't even exist, became indispensable to the German war effort. The Abwehr thought that Arabelle was doing such a good job that they didn't even bother sending any other spies to infiltrate Britain. 
And despite his cultural knowledge being very spotty at best, the intel that Arabel provided was so detailed that Talty reckoned that the Germans probably didn't think that anyone could have been able to fake it. And they didn't dare to doubt him in case he walked off and took his entire spy network with him. However, Arabel still hadn't been able to get the attention of the British, and at one point he was on the cusp of just giving up and emigrating to Brazil. His lack of genuine insider information and military knowledge was starting to become problematic because the Abwehr were starting to ask for more and more detailed reports and Arabel didn't know how to handle the increasing demands. However, unbeknownst to him, his wife Araceli went to the US Embassy in Lisbon and arranged a meeting with a naval attaché and a member of MI6, who thought that she was nothing more than an adventuress. And they gave her some money for the bus home to thank her for her time in trouble. Obviously, this is pretty insulting, and it's a good thing that Arabelle didn't find out, because he might not have persisted in his efforts otherwise. But, nevertheless, Araceli's trip to the embassy did put Arabelle on MI6's radar. After six months of gathering intelligence for the Germans, it finally happened. Arabelle was spotted in the spring of 1942. Senpai had finally noticed him. MI5 picked up messages from London to Arabelle's spymaster in Madrid, and they were very confused. They had never heard of this Arabelle, despite being aware of all of the enemy spies in the country. Naturally, they freaked out quite a bit because it looked like someone had snuck in and was giving away all of Britain's secrets. At first, the reports were so believable that it seemed like the British had a massive problem on their hands, especially when they noticed that while the Kriegsmarine had wasted a lot of time and resources chasing after a convoy in Malta that Arabelle had completely made up, his report was unsettlingly close to actually being true. A convoy bound for Malta had actually left Liverpool, but the date and the number of ships that Arabelle had reported didn't match reality. This was just a sheer lucky guess. This was some intel bullshit that Arabelle had just completely made up that, by sheer chance, turned out to be partly true. Arabelle wasn't actually in the country and had no way of knowing, but you can imagine how the British spooks were, well, spooked by this. He actually pulled the same trick a few weeks later, telling the Germans that an armada was leaving Wales, but this time the U-boats and Italian fighter planes were really just chasing their tails. Because it was a lie. Upon closer inspection of the messages, MI5 were very reassured after realising that this intelligence was just a series of false flags. But they also ended up even more confused because the information was so completely useless and its comprehension of anything British was so lacking that the author was clearly not living in Britain and was definitely not from there. However, they had to admit that there was some potential in the way that Arabelle was giving the Germans the runaround. Further reassurance came when MI6 admitted that they knew about Arabelle pretty much the whole time, not just because of the meeting at the American Embassy, but also because by this point the British had cracked the Enigma code and they were reading all of his messages. By the way, the difference between MI5 and MI6 is just like the FBI and CIA. The former works at home, and the latter works internationally. Well, on paper at least. So MI5 decided to see what Arabelle could do with real backing and resources. So they smuggled him and his family into England via Gibraltar in April of 1942. Upon arriving, Arabelle met a pair of agents named Thomas Harris and Cyril Mills, with the latter recalling... One, a short man with slicked back dark hair, revealing a high forehead and warm brown eyes with a slight mischievous glint, smiled as I shook his hand. I spent the next four hours translating the messages he had sent to the Abwehr into English. In the afternoon, I started the preliminary debriefing. As the representative of MI6, it was my task for the next eight days to interrogate this enigmatic Catalan. Things seemed to go well as the MI5 agents got to know Arabelle. And he was recruited, taught English, he was codenamed Bovril because Britain or 
because he was Spanish and they were being a little bit racist. And finally, he got to send the Germans a report that contained information about Britain that was actually true. Bovro received a pretty comprehensive education pretty quickly, with one of his superiors recalling it was not, in fact, until he came here that he realised that it was not the custom of English labourers to drink their bottle of wine as they do in Spain. Bovro and his family were moved into a safe house in a London suburb, from which he worked and became very fast friends with his handler, the half-Spanish Thomas Harris, and a translator named Sarah Bishop. With the dream team together, it became very clear that MI5 was very, very lucky to have Bovro. MI6 operatives decrypting German communications found that many of his reports had been marked as urgent and forwarded to Berlin. As Harris put it, Garbo's reports formed the backbone of all German intelligence appreciation, on which vital operational decisions were taken. Harris and Bovro put what MI5 described as the latter's fertile imagination to better use than ever, working, and I quote, on average from six to eight hours a day, drafting secret letters, enciphering, composing cover texts, writing them and planning for the future. Fortunately, he has a facile and lurid style, great ingenuity and a passionate and quixotic zeal for his task. Bovro's first major job was covering up Operation Torch, which was a huge invasion of North Africa and the Allies' first major push of the war. He sent the Germans a real report saying that a convoy of warships was leaving port and going down the Clyde, decked out in Mediterranean camel, which was postmarked in a more than timely manner and would have tipped off the Germans about it. If Bovro hadn't made sure that it was delayed in the post so that by the time it arrived, the information was useless. Despite being left unable to see Operation Torch coming thanks to Bovro's efforts, the Germans still gave him props, saying, We are sorry they arrived too late, but your last reports were magnificent. And similar props were also given to Bovro by MI5, who changed his code name to Garbo, after the actress Greta Garbo, in honour of his own performance of being the greatest actor in the world. The newly rechristened Garbo and Harris worked around the clock to make the former's fake spy network more formidable than ever, in what was, and I quote, one of those rare partnerships between two exceptionally gifted men whose inventive genius inspired and complemented each other. The pair wrote hundreds of letters together, which had an average length of 2,000 words, though some of them contained up to 8,000 words. The Germans were inundated with so much information that by the time the war was over, all of the reports that Garbo had wrote to them to pad out his network filled about 50 volumes. 50 volumes of... Absolute shite, because most of the information was completely false. But with access to real intelligence, those little snippets of the truth became juicier than ever for the Germans. And the yarns that Garbo had spun became more compelling than ever. But he couldn't just rest on his laurels. Sure, the world building and characters were all firmly established, but Garbo still had to keep the plot going. Lest the Germans get suspicious of the fact that everything they were being sent was completely useless. For example, a German agent of Garbo's named Gerber was undercover in Liverpool, where he was watching a fleet being prepared at the port. Unfortunately, Garbo couldn't not mention it because missing something this big and obvious to anyone in the area would be very suspicious. So, instead of omitting it from the report, Gerber just went dark for a while. Garbo then told Federico that he hadn't heard from Gerber in several weeks and was getting very worried about him. He then went to visit and found that Gerber had gotten terribly sick. Sadly, Gerber passed away from his illness, but MI5 was kind enough to mark his passing with a notice in the Liverpool Echo, which Garbo forwarded to his German handlers. In the obituary, it was requested that no one send flowers, which I thought was a nice touch. After all, you can't send flowers to a grave that doesn't exist. But the story didn't end there. Garbo also employed poor Gerber's widow as his housekeeper. She 
didn't exist either, of course, but she did bake Garbo a cake in which he smuggled a British aircraft recognition booklet to the Germans. In true Garbo fashion, this was a very important piece of intel which would have been very useful to the war effort if it wasn't out of date. While Garbo was making waves with his reporting on the big troop movements and spreading the fog of war, he was also adept at helping to keep people safe on the home front. Whenever the Germans wanted to bomb civilian trains, he sent them outdated timetables. And when they shot down a plane that a famous actor named Leslie Howard was travelling in, Garbo chewed them the fuck out because one of his agents could have been on that plane. And the Germans were so embarrassed by their carelessness that they didn't do it again. After all, the Garbo network was one of their biggest assets. So big, in fact, that Hitler himself read some of his reports and a Nazi memo said that Garbo was worth 45,000 men. Garbo's influence over the Germans was really, really strong at this point. They were hinging all of their operational decisions on his reports. One such report was about a huge arms dump under Chislehurst that was connected to an underground train network across London. And the Germans actually thought about sending in a team to destroy it because they trusted Garbo that much. They also regularly gave Garbo the latest ciphers to aid in communications, which Garbo just immediately handed over to the British codebreakers. But this wasn't enough, and in 1943, the British spooks decided that they wanted radio contact with the Germans. So Garbo told the Germans that he had just happened to befriend a radio mechanic who would be willing to discreetly hook him up. And that August, a secure channel was set up and British intelligence was in closer contact with the Germans than ever, with thousands of messages being sent by Garbo and Harris, making up the vast majority of Garbo's communications from that point onwards. Garbo's sheer prowess in spycraft had become legendary, but the best psyop that he ever pulled actually had nothing to do with the war. His next target was his own wife. Despite having helped Garbo get his foot in the door with the abware, Araceli wasn't really useful to the cause anymore, and she no longer had anything to do. Now that Garbo was set up and thriving with Harris and the boys in MI5, as a result, Araceli was left terribly homesick, lonely, and bored. Which was made worse by the fact that she barely saw Garbo because he was so busy working. And he was Araceli's only company because she couldn't talk to other Spanish people in London or even contact her friends back in Spain in case she let something slip. And since she spoke no English, she couldn't really communicate with anyone else. Despite that little house being the only safe place in the world for her and her kids, Araceli felt imprisoned in her home and she just couldn't handle it which put a massive strain on her relationship with Garbo. As Harris reported, Araceli's acute homesickness was brought on by the fact that she had, and I quote, never managed to adapt to the English way of living, neither has she been able to learn the language. Araceli hated everything about her new home. She hated the weather and described the food as too much macaroni, too many potatoes, not enough fish. Bitch, there's a fucking war on. There are a lot of things that many can say about British cuisine, and I will hear fucking none of it. Do you want to know why we still eat as if rationing never went away? It's because that shit is fucking delicious, that's why. And complaining about lack of fish in English food is just beyond stupid. Fuck your paella. We are famous for doing our fish properly, to the point where it's the only thing that the Yanks actually get right about our culture. The communal slop that the rest of the world has, has nothing, nothing. Nothing on the organised glory of the British palate. Cope and seethe all you want, foreigners. I'm sorry that your taste buds are so run through like an ethaw on OnlyFans from all of those spices that you use to cover up the taste of your rancid meat that you can't appreciate the simple elegance of a wholesome, rich, hearty British meal bestowed upon us from the heavens by the big G himself, Greg. We didn't take over the world for your spices. We didn't need them. We did it because we fucking could. Rule Britannia. 
For obvious reasons, a visit home was absolutely out of the question. So regardless of how desperately she wanted to, Araceli couldn't even escape the oh-so-awful ordeal of being stuck in the greatest country on earth. As Harris observed, and I quote, her desire to return to her country, and in particular to see her mother, has driven her to behave at times as if she were unbalanced. She has, for many months, begged me to make arrangements for her to return to her hometown, even for a week. MI5 was kind enough to make Araceli a bit more comfortable by getting her a dozen pairs of silk stockings which was still kind of a big gesture because silk was rationed at the time. They had to send an agent all the way to Lisbon to get them. If she really wanted to feel like she was back home, couldn't she have just, like, gone for an afternoon nap or something? I don't know, those people sleep a lot. But MI5 literally running side quests for this bitch just wasn't enough for Araceli, which led to Harris lamenting that, and I quote... She is a highly emotional and neurotic woman and therefore I have never definitively disillusioned her in her hopes that she might be allowed to see her mother before the termination of the war. This was very, very bad. MI5 was no longer just worried about Araceli accidentally letting something slip, but they were now seriously concerned about her actively betraying her husband and actively trying to fuck everything up by blowing the whistle on the entire 20 committee, which was the division that handled Garbo and all of the other double agents. This would have been a massive blow to the war effort, not just because Garbo would be put in danger and his wife would probably be hanged for treason, but also because the 20 committee was so effective that MI5 reported that they actively ran and controlled the German espionage system in the country. Obviously, the majority of the 40 operatives were German spies who were captured and then switched over in exchange for the continuation of their lives. But Garbo was quite notable for becoming a double agent voluntarily, which basically never happened. Also, it's called the 20 Committee because in Roman numerals, it's two X's. Double cross. Get it? Double agent betraying their own nation. Double cross. In the most British move ever, MI5 made the name of their double agent division a fucking pun. Unfortunately, MI5's fears were proven right on the 21st of June 1943, when Araceli called Harris and threatened to carry out one of the most devastating women moments of all time. She was planning to march into the Spanish embassy and blow Garbo's cover if she wasn't allowed to go back to Spain, yelling, I don't want to live another day in England. Araceli had to be put back in her place, but as Harris put it, treated firmly but with every respect. Because simply shutting her up wouldn't help anyone in the long run. MI5 needed to get her back on side without any bitterness or resentment. And luckily, they had their top guy to help. Garbo took the lead and hatched a plan. Under his direction, he was arrested over Araceli's hysterics and Harris told her that it was her fault. Araceli, not taking this particularly well, then phoned an MI5 operator who did his due diligence by making a visit to her house, where he found that she had used her time with German intelligence to exploit their most devastating weapon. She was sitting in the kitchen with all of the gas taps turned on. The operator called bullshit on her because he was 90% sure that Araceli was just threatening suicide to get back at Garbo. So, he called her bluff and refused to allow her to leave the country. As Harris reported, and I quote, she thought that if she could lure him around, that she would terrify him by a pretense of suicide. That, when he reported to us, as she had anticipated in panic, she would have called our bluff and we would come running up to her. Clearly, Araceli had misread the Spook's playbook, because when you are at an impasse with the deep state, you don't kill yourself, they kill yourself. But taking note of her distress, MI5 arranged for her to be taken to an interrogation centre where Garbo was brought out wearing a prison uniform. 
This whole pantomime spectacle upset Araceli so much that she immediately bucked her ideas up, begged for Garbo's release, and signed an apology promising not to do anything stupid ever again. To really set the ruse, Garbo also fabricated a statement that he had made to a non-existent tribunal. And a fellow MI5 officer was so impressed that he said that it had shades of Pericles. But while the operation was a resounding success, a watch was also put on the Spanish embassy ready to grab Araceli if she ever tried to set foot in there. You know, just in case. But yeah, Garbo psyoped his own fucking wife. Garbo gaslit his own wife so fucking hard that he not only got actual spooks to help him, but it also led to her almost gaslighting herself. Okay. You just became my hero. Thank you. But yeah, I bet a lot of you didn't know that. We almost lost the fucking war over a woman moment. But while Operation Women Moment was by far Garbo's funniest work, his finest hour, the apotheosis of his entire career, began at the start of the following year. In January of 1944, the Germans contacted Garbo and informed him of their suspicions that the Allies were getting ready to invade Europe wanting him to find out more about it and keep an eye on any unusual troop movements. And what luck! That January, Garbo had just started work as part of Operation Bodyguard, which was a massive, multifaceted cover-up of Operation Overlord, which was the Allied invasion of France. The objective of the operation wasn't just to take the Germans by surprise by keeping them guessing the date and location, but also to spread their forces as thin as possible so they couldn't send reinforcements to repel the D-Day landings in Normandy. To keep Jerry's attention away from there, a number of sub-operations were carried out to varying degrees of success. We don't have time to get into all of them in detail, but the more notable ones include Operation Zeppelin, which aimed to convince the Germans that forces in Egypt were preparing for a three-pronged attack on Greece, Crete and the Balkans, which is fairly believable because when isn't there fighting in the Balkans? My personal favourite sub-operation was Operation Vendetta, in which the Allies hired an actor to pretend to be General Montgomery and to go on a tour of bases all across North Africa and let slip that the Allies were planning to invade France from the Mediterranean coast. He was also sent on an official visit to Spain to start rumours that Spain might not be so unwavering in its neutrality. Operation Ironside aimed to convince the Germans that an invasion force would land at Bordeaux in the west of France a few days after D-Day. This actually went hand in hand with Operation Vendetta because forces from both operations were supposed to meet after landing and completing their objectives. Garbo was involved in this as one of his sub-agents had reported to the Germans that such a force was being assembled. Though Garbo also sent the Germans a disclaimer saying that the sub-agent was unreliable to secure plausible deniability in case they didn't believe him. Garbo's credibility would be more critical than ever for his main role in Operation Bodyguard. Operations Grafham and Royal Flush involved chicanery in Sweden. Operation Royal Flush involved convincing the Germans that Sweden was going to join the Allies, and Operation Grafham was simply a meeting to ask the Swedes if the British could fly in their airspace and land and refuel aircraft in their territory. Whether the Swedes actually said yes or no to this request, or whether they were about to end their neutrality or not, didn't actually matter at all. The goal was to convince the Germans that the Allies were planning to invade Norway. These operations didn't really work, but they do bring us nicely to Operation Fortitude. Operation Fortitude was twofold, north and south. Fortitude North was the congregation of a skeleton crew in Edinburgh to look like the Allies were preparing for a big invasion of Norway. Of course, this invasion was never going to happen, but the Germans didn't know that. So, three whole divisions ended up freezing their arses off, wishing that they had been duped by Operation Fortitude South instead. And Operation Fortitude South was wholly Garbo's domain. His masterpiece, if you will. 
So, what genius did Garbo pull to keep the wool over Jerry's eyes? After all, it's kind of hard to hide the biggest invasion of all time because the Germans could literally see gathering forces from the other side of the channel. They knew that something was coming. So, in true Garbo fashion, he told them all about it. Throughout Operation Fortitude, Garbo sent a total of 500 messages over four daily radio transmissions between January and June, in which he told them that 75 divisions had amassed in the southeast of England, ready to invade France. But while having a million men for the invasion would have been nice, there really was just 50 divisions, but Garbo needed the numbers inflated for his plan to work. But while Garbo was working around the clock to lay the groundwork, it wasn't until the 11th hour when it was his time to shine. Garbo told the Germans to keep the secure channel open for a high priority message at 3am on the 6th of June, better known as D-Day. He told them that Normandy was about to be attacked, but he did it just too late for them to do anything in the way of setting up fortifications because by this time the ships were already on their way. And by straight up telling the Germans about the attack on Normandy, Garbo firmly cemented his credibility for the chicanery to come. Because how do you hide the biggest invasion of all time? Well, you tell the enemy that an even bigger invasion is coming next. Yes, Garbo used the actual D-Day landings as a sort of reverse Blackgate gambit. Sure, the D-Day landings were definitely happening at Normandy, but they were really just a diversion to cover up the real secret threat that would bring the Third Reich to an end. He said there were 11 divisions totaling 150,000 men ready and waiting to storm Calais. Calais was chosen as the fake target for the real British invasion because it's 200 miles away from Normandy, closer to Berlin, has flat beaches and is located at the narrowest point in the English Channel, which made it a very believable landing site. And who would have thought that all of these years later we would be the ones getting invaded from Calais? After Garbo's strategically delayed briefing on D-Day, the plan was to draw German reserves away from Normandy by contacting them again a few days later and telling them that the main force was about to arrive and hit Calais. However, this second stage never came to pass because the Germans didn't answer Garbo's 3am message until five hours later, and by then, the landings had already been in progress for two hours. Garbo then reached out and chewed the Germans the fuck out for fobbing him off by saying, I am very disgusted in this struggle for life and death. I cannot accept excuses or negligence. I cannot swallow the idea of endangering the service without any benefit. Were it not for my ideals and faith, I would abandon this work as having proved myself a failure. And the Germans actually apologised to him. So, with the Abwehr put firmly back in their place and German High Command more firmly in Garbo's pocket than ever, the real work could begin. Garbo continued to finesse the German reinforcements away from Normandy, with the Germans keeping two armoured divisions and 19 infantry divisions safely out of the Allies' way in Calais, and their defences at Normandy in a very sorry state. General Friedrich Dolman put on war games, Rommel had the day off to go and pick wildflowers and see his wife for her birthday, and the weather was so shit that the army's state of readiness was greatly reduced because who the fuck would want to invade in these conditions? The British, because we're fucking used to this kind of weather. Also, the German commanders were so sure that the real invasion was going to hit Calais that they didn't even bother to wake Hitler up to notify him when go time had finally arrived. So yeah, the Germans were somewhat caught, you know, with their pants completely down. And the D-Day landings were successful. All because of some paella munching larper. For two days, Operation Overlord went on with little resistance until Hitler finally sent in panzer divisions from Calais to attack the forces at Normandy on the 9th of June. 
Obviously, this would not do because panzer divisions could be very devastating for the Allied push. So Garbo responded by radioing over reports from three of his agents across Britain, corroborating the fact that the 150,000 strong main force led by General Patton was still waiting at Dover, which Garbo named FUSAG, the first US army group. To sell the ruse, Garbo and British intelligence pulled every trick in the book and turned the place into Disneyland for teenage boys. There were fake ships, fake airstrips with planes made of plywood, fake letters from locals complaining about rowdy soldiers, a massive oil storage complex designed by one of Britain's foremost architects that was actually put together by a movie studio, and inflatable tanks. The commitment to authenticity was so great that they even put out fake radio chatter, released messenger pigeons with FUSAG ID tags to fly them into enemy territory so that they could be captured on purpose, and they used wind machines to blow dust across the channel to really sell the idea that the southeast of England had been turned into a massive construction site. But to really clinch it, part of Garbo's report was an urgent and very long oh fuck message that Hitler himself actually read, which said, and I quote, It is perfectly clear that the present attack is a large-scale attack, but diversionary in character, to draw the maximum of our reserves so as to be able to strike a blow somewhere else with assured success. The constant aerial bombardment which the area of the Paddy Calais has suffered and the strange disposition of these forces give reason to suggest an attack in that region of France which at the same time offers the shortest route for the final objective of their delusions. Berlin. The best thing about this message is the fact that Garbo was so good that even German intelligence was unwittingly helping to sell the ruse because Hitler's personal intelligence officer underlined the word diversionary before sending the message to the Führer's desk. Thoroughly convinced of the threat to Calais, Hitler turned the tanks around, and he refused to send any more reinforcements for seven weeks, during which Garbo continued to grima worm tongue him into staying put, which can't have been hard because, I mean, look at him, like, during this point in the war, Hitler was on a lot of fucking drugs, man. I mean, that guy is obviously paranoid and sees armies everywhere, you know? Like, he was... He was fucking tweaking, but Garbo had successfully diverted most of the German forces out of the way of Normandy and managed to keep them away for seven weeks. Mission accomplished. Operation Overlord went on successfully, Private Ryan was saved, Garbo was awarded with both an Iron Cross and an MBE, and France was given back to the French, but that's okay, you can't win them all. Garbo was the only person to be decorated by both sides for his role in the war. And not only that, but they also broke with tradition to do so. The Iron Cross was exclusively for frontline combatants, but Hitler decided to make an exception for Garbo on the 29th of July, to which Garbo responded, I cannot at this moment, when emotion overcomes me, express in words my gratitude for the decoration conceded by our Führer to whom, humbly and with every respect, I express my gratitude for the high distinction which he bestowed on me, for which I feel myself unworthy as I have never done more than what I considered to be the fulfilment of my duty. Probably wrote that with his fingers crossed behind his back. On the other side of the war, MBEs are only given out to British citizens, so unfortunately it had to be presented without all of the usual pomp and circumstance at a private banquet in his honour just before the Christmas of 1944. But Garbo was touched by the gesture all the same, recalling, and I quote, I was very proud to be given the MBE during the war, although it had to be presented to me privately. I had prepared a little speech for the occasion, and when I had been given it, all those present began to bang on the table to congratulate me. It was a very moving moment. Garbo was also given a cut of the $340,000 that German intelligence had paid him and his agents, because the money was just going straight to MI5. 
adjusted for inflation, that is almost $6 million. And I don't know about you, but I think that's quite a lot of money. But it was more than well earned because never mind saving thousands of lives, Garbo might have actually won the Allies the war because if he hadn't talked Hitler into turning those tanks around, they might have completely thwarted the invasion. His heroics were even mentioned in passing in a report by Eisenhower, who said, and I quote, the German 15th Army, which, if committed to battle in June or July, might possibly have defeated us by sheer weight of numbers, remained inoperative throughout the critical period of the campaign. And only when the breakthrough had been achieved were its infantry divisions brought west across the Seine. Too late to have any effect upon the course of victory. After all that, the cherry on the cake was the fact that the Germans never found out what Garbo had done to them. <laughs> they never. It wasn't until years later that they actually figured it out. Even when Garbo went back to Spain and met up with his old handler, Federico, who was obviously very bummed out about losing the war, no one figured it out. So Garbo offered his sympathies and his continued services. But of course, the Spanish branch of the German secret service had been disbanded and Federico encouraged Garbo's plan to move to South America because while Spain's neutrality made it a relatively safe place for Nazis to lie low, those that work in intelligence tend to be actively hunted. Garbo was rather amenable to the idea and was looking to move to Venezuela himself because... Argentina was taken. But little did Federico realise that it wasn't the Allies that Garbo was looking to hide from. Garbo and Araceli went back to Madrid for a while, where the former kept in touch with his old German colleagues to keep up appearances. But he was very, very worried about the Nazis realising what he had done and seeking revenge. Araceli collected Arabelle's last payment from the German embassy and the family used fake papers to move to Venezuela by way of Brazil. Once settled in his new home, Garbo took on a job as an English language teacher for Shell Oil and he also owned a gift shop and bookstore named La Casa del Regalo. But sadly, this new life didn't exactly stick. Despite being thousands and thousands of miles away from England and surrounded by Spanish speakers, the far side of the world didn't suit Araceli at all. She got fed up very quickly and went back to the same shit that she was doing in London. Except this time, there was no excuse for not returning to Spain. As the historian Nigel West put it, and I quote, Araceli was a very difficult woman and was very homesick and didn't like living in either London or Venezuela. She really wanted to go back to Spain, and Juan agreed that they would sell up and go back to Spain. While 1943's Operation Women moment was a masterstroke, hell hath no fury, so Garbo opted against scorning Araceli for a second time and acquiesced to her demands. In 1948, Araceli took the kids and moved back to Spain, with Garbo promising that he would sort out the last of his business in Venezuela and then go after her. However, that business was actually one final job. That's right, it was a trick, a ruse, a bamboozle, if you will. Garbo refused to be longhoused. So, it was time for Operation Woman Moment 2, Electric Boogaloo. Because, you see, Garbo was still very worried about Nazi reprisal. So, he and Harris pulled one last psyop for the road. Faking Garbo's death. In 1949, Harris spread the word across MI5 that Garbo had died of malaria while on a trip to Angola, and the spooks then reported his passing to Araceli and the kids. Basically, Garbo, Garbo went, you know what, fuck that bitch. <laughs> he just fucking faked his death and just took off from the wife and kids, that was it. It was over, but while Spymaster Garbo was dead, Juan Pucol Garcia stayed in Venezuela and disguised himself by growing a beard and wearing glasses. And then he remarried, had three more kids, and just lived his life for the next few decades. So, he kind of just completely abandoned his wife, but hey, who could blame him, fucking whiny bitch? 
But eventually, Pukul's past finally caught up with him. After having sensed a cover-up, the aforementioned Nigel West spent a decade searching for Pukul and finally discovered him in 1984. Funnily enough, Pukul didn't actually have to stay dead for that long. I mean, he was more than safe from any kind of reprisals after the 60s had passed, but he was just really committed to the bit. The 72-year-old Pukol returned to Europe for the 40th anniversary of D-Day, where he was honoured at Buckingham Palace and personally thanked by one of his biggest fans, the Duke of Edinburgh. He also reunited with his very shocked children. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Dad, Daddy had to fake the entire thing because Mum was such a bitch. Uh, his former colleagues were also very, very shocked because they also thought he was dead. He then went to Omaha Beach, where the Allies had successfully invaded France, thanks to his efforts. But when he visited the graves of those who didn't make it, he tearfully lamented that while thousands of men were alive thanks to him, he didn't do enough. However, word had spread that Pukol was there, and a number of veterans came to see him, one of whom grabbed him by the arm and declared, I have the pleasure of introducing Garbo, the man who saved our lives. Now, you might be wondering how this video could be made in the first place since MI5 doesn't normally reveal the identities of their agents for obvious reasons. But since the jig was up after his discovery, Pukol wrote an autobiography under his own name in 1985, making him fair game for anyone that wanted to thank him for his service. And it's nice that after so long in hiding, Pukol was able to bask in some of the glory of his heroic achievements before he passed away from a stroke at his home in Caracas on the 10th of October 1988 at the age of 76. Among the honours that comprises Pukul's legacy is a blue plaque at the safe house where he lived and did most of his work. And what's truly remarkable to me is the fact that, for all intents and purposes, he was just a completely ordinary guy. It wasn't until after Pukul was thick in the weeds of German intelligence that he discovered his true power. Before that, he was just life's journeyman bouncing from job to job, never really excelling in anything. I mean, the man literally couldn't even raise chickens. And yet, he still saw the state of things around him and chose to do the right thing with whatever he had to offer. As Stefan Talty put it, and I quote, Pukol had failed in almost everything that he had tried in his 32 years. Student, businessman, cinema magnate, soldier, his marriage was falling apart, but in one specialised area of war, the espionage subworld known as the Double Cross Game, the young man was a kind of savant. And he knew it. After years of suffering and doubt, Agent Garbo felt he was ready to match wits with the best minds of the Third Reich. For the longest time, Pukol seemed to be fated to eternal mediocrity, as he didn't find his calling until he was in his 30s and balding. And even then, he was rejected out of hand three times. But that didn't stop him, and after he put in all of the work to get his foot in the door, he became a legend. If that's not inspiring, I don't know what is. If there is one thing that some of you neats out there can take from this video, it's that it's never too late. If Pukol could keep on going until he found his niche and trolled his way into winning the biggest war of all time, any one of you can touch grass and go make something of yourselves. Don't go anywhere. You sit right there. I've got live shows coming up in London this December and you can buy tickets to them down below and come to see me. I've got a small show at Comedy Unleashed and then I've got two big shows later in the week. You can, you can come to my shows if you buy tickets in the links down below. For the four women who watch this channel, you can buy them as an early Christmas present for your man friend or boy toy or whatever the hell you've got i don't i don't know what women do but still come come to my show and i will tell funny jokes and i promise i'll only be a little bit racist just a little bit just a little bit racist but anyway come come to my show i want i want to i want to see you all in person so i can fight you it's